All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, if you are on the East Coast, and good morning if you are on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for being here for today's Bloomerang webinar, Writing to Advance Your Nonprofit Career. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion as always. And just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started officially. I want to let you all know that we are recording this presentation. And I'll be sending out the recording as well as the slides later on this afternoon in case you didn't already get those. So if you have to leave early or perhaps you want to rewatch the content or share it with a colleague, uh, you'll be able to do that. Just look for an email from me with all those goodies later on today. And as you're listening today, please feel free to use that chat box right there on your webinar screen. Uh, we're going to save some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so don't be shy at all. We would love to see your questions and comments. You can even share those questions on Twitter. You can use the hashtag Bloomerang or send us a tweet directly at Bloomerang Tech uh, if you are a Twitter type person. And if you are listening by phone today, if you have any, if you have any trouble listening by your computer speakers rather, um, be sure to uh, dial in by phone. It's usually a little bit better quality. If you don't mind doing that, if you don't mind dialing in by phone, uh, please do that. There's a dedicated phone number there uh, right in the email from ReadyTalk. So if you have any internet problems, usually a little bit better by phone. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, I want to say a special welcome to you. We do do these webinars just about every Thursday. Uh, but in addition to that, we offer uh, really great donor management software. If you are in the market for that or maybe thinking about switching sometime soon, check us out. You can look at a quick video demo of the software. And, uh, and learn all about us there. But for now, I want to say a special welcome to one of my favorite people, our longest running uh, repeat webinar guest. Linda has done a Boomerang webinar with us every year since 2013. She's the reigning queen, uh, and I am so glad to have her back. How's it going, Linda? Good. <laughs> so you're joining us from uh, cold but sunny Las Vegas, is that right? Right. <laughs> well, Linda, I want to brag on you for just a couple of minutes before I hand things over to you. Uh, if you guys don't know Linda, you got to know her. She has managed capital campaigns. She's helped hundreds of nonprofits uh, achieve their fundraising and development goals. She has trained over 27,000 fundraisers throughout the world, including Canada, Mexico, Egypt, and Bermuda, uh, over her 20-plus years as a, a fundraising consultant. She is the author of way too many books. I could not even fit all of your books in this slide, Linda, but I'll try to get through some of my favorites. Um, she's the author of Recruiting and Training Fundraising Volunteers, The Development Plan, Fundraising a Career as a Career, Capital Campaigns, Everything You Need to Know, which is actually on my bookshelf behind me. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Are You Ready for a Capital Campaign? Raising More Money from Your Business Community. Linda, I don't even know how you've had time to write all these books and still do <laughs> webinars and all your work. This is crazy. Um, but you are obviously a prolific writer, and I'm excited for this webinar because we're going we're gonna to do something a little bit different today. Usually we do sort of best practices in fundraising, but we're going to kind of shift gears and give you all some ammo to maybe help your personal endeavors and your own uh, careers uh, and hopefully let you share all of your own fundraising knowledge through, through books and webinars and blog posts. So uh, Linda is definitely an expert in that, as you can see. So Linda, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, to tell us all about writing to advance your career. Take it away, my okay. friend. Thank you, Stephen. It's really great to be back. I didn't realize how I long I've been on webinars uh, for this group, but apparently it's been longer than I remembered that it was. And just to let some of you know, well, there was a, a little bit of a glitch in the early announcement. So this is writing to advance your nonprofit career. Um, if you're looking for a different webinar, this might not be the one. But I hope you'll stay tuned anyway, because writing is important to all of us in our fundraising careers and, and to grow in, as a nonprofit person, even um, no matter what you're writing about. But I want to start by telling you a little bit about my story. And this is one of my favorite pictures. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, this person is a natural born writer. They have a gift from God or something. But writers can be born or made. I really believe that very sincerely. And this picture of me, I think I was about a year and a half old on this picture. And I'm holding one of my favorite, if you want to call it a toy, it's a, a huge pencil that I got as a gift from my parents when I was very young, obviously. Um, I didn't play much with dolls, but I loved playing with pencils and I loved writing. And I have one 
recollection of maybe a year or so after this picture where my parents were painting their living room walls. So they gave me free reign to write all over the walls. And then, of course, I also had to come in and help them do the painting. So I think my father was the original Huckleberry Finn. I'm not sure. But he got me to help paint by letting me first draw and write on the walls. So I've always loved writing. Um, I didn't write novels or books or anything at that age, obviously, but at the age of about 10, I started writing short stories. So to me, I guess I'm one of the writers who was born. I, I always felt this affinity to write. But there are many people who don't feel like they were born with the gift to write. I remember one of the first fundraising consultants I ever worked with, and he was a really knowledgeable person, and I thought he was a fantastic writer. And once he shared with me that his biggest challenge as a consultant was to learn to write because he had to write the case for support, he had to write campaign plans, he had to write a lot of different things for his clients. And he said that was a real struggle for him, learning to write. So you can learn writing, but some people have a natural talent and a natural gift for it. So I went from this year-and-a-half-old little child holding a pencil very proudly to being the author today of a number of different books. And here's, I actually thought, wondered if I could squeeze all my books <laughs> onto a slide, but I managed to do it. These are all the books that I have either authored, co-authored, co-edited, or been a contributing, contributing author to. So you can see that... Um, I'm obviously a very prolific writer, but you don't have to be this prolific. So let's talk a little bit about how writing is important to all of us in this field and why. Um, I think writing can help you become a stronger fundraiser because so much of what we do, you might not think of writing as a big part of your job because maybe you think your job is getting out and talking to donors, and of course it is. But so much of what we do does involve writing. It's writing that case for support so we have something to go out and talk to donors about. It's writing reports for our board and our CEO and our development committee. It might be writing grant proposals. That's a huge part of many organizations' jobs. But even if most of your area focuses on something else like working with a business community or doing special events, there's still going to be writing involved. You have to write things for the website. There's so many different things that you have to write. So learning to write is really going to help you become a stronger fundraiser. As this consultant told me, it made him a better consultant, and he actually took some classes in learning to write, and there are many, many excellent classes out there that can help you learn to write better. So you can become a stronger fundraiser if you're a better writer. Another thing that I think it helps you with is impressing your boss, or in the case of consultants, some of you are probably consultants out there as well, and you may need to impress your clients. I know one of the things that I had to do when I went into business for myself, obviously, was craft proposals for my clients. So learning how to put the scope of work concisely into a proposal that wasn't 100 pages long and nobody would read it. To me, that's always been one of the biggest challenges of writing is to write concisely. I think it was Mark Twain who was given an assignment to write a maybe a three-page story, and he uh, accomplished this, but he said it, he could have done it much faster if he was writing a 100-page story than he was to write a three-page story. So sometimes just learning to write concisely and get rid of the extra verbiage is a real challenge. But you can impress your boss if you're a development officer now and you're looking for maybe uh, to get promoted within your organization. The better skilled you become at writing, the more you can write accurate reports and you can write persuasive literature. And I have found that it was really helpful for me as a consultant to learn to impress my clients with my writing skills as well. Most people, though, honestly, I, when I talk to other authors, and I know a lot of authors and talk to a lot of them, I think they do it a lot for the personal satisfaction. As I said, I've always 
been fascinated by writing. So I grew up thinking I have a lot to share with people. And one of the reasons I started writing books was because um, Steve mentioned I spoken to 27,000 people. I think that is a, actually that figure has gone up now to closer to 40,000 people. But it's great to contact 40,000 people, but I don't get to see everybody that I want to talk to and, and convey my knowledge to in person. So by writing books, to me, I find it really satisfying that I'll oftentimes get a letter from somebody. And when Steve mentioned the comment that he had one of my books on the shelf behind him, and it's one of his favorite books. That, to me, is really rewarding that the knowledge that I have and I have been able to impart to other people, when I get an email from someone that says, oh, I read one of your books, and uh, you know I have it underlined and it's all geared, and I've really used it to help put together my development plan or whatever, that to me is extremely rewarding. So the personal satisfaction of writing is really amazing for some people. And I think for most people, if you have any kind of an ego that's motivated by helping others, that to me is the biggest satisfaction of writing because I know I'm helping other people. So it's helping my career, but it's more helping other people as well. Now, of course, some of us, get into the business of writing to make money, and that's always a motivating factor. It is for me. I just got royalty checks a couple of weeks ago, and it's really great to open up those royalty checks and be able to deposit that and think, well, all my money has paid off in the long run. But unless you're um, J.K. Rowling or Dan Brown or uh, some other famous author, you're probably not going to be making a million dollars writing for the nonprofit sector. So I think it's it's good to make that clear up front that it's not primarily money that motivates most most writers, although it is really great to get those royalty checks. But don't get the idea in your head that by becoming an author and writing one book for the nonprofit sector, you're going to make a whole lot of money because the nonprofit sector, while it's about 10% of our economy in the United States, you still have a limited audience, and also nonprofit books don't sell as many as, as a, a fiction book will sell. So I did take a stab at writing fiction, but I'm still not a millionaire. <laughs> so I just wanted to make that clear to everyone that it's not always the money that motivates us to get into writing, but it does help, and it really is nice to be able to show that that money at the end of the year or in the six months. Most publishers pay a six-month royalty fee, so that helps too. So what kind of writing can you do and should you be doing and should you think about getting better? At? Well, as I said, there's writing for your work in the nonprofit sector, a lot of you probably spend a ton of time writing grant proposals because they can be very, very um, time-consuming. And what I, I, I have found, I don't do a whole lot of grants, but what I have found is that most grant proposals that I'm helping clients with are now done strictly online, and I think that's the hardest part of it is, well, we have 75 words to say this, and we have 150 words to say that, and we have... 300 characters to say this. So writing proposals can be very challenging because it's getting things into very concise language. Writing your case for support is a whole other category, and this is, to me, one of the most important pieces of writing that any development office has. When I took jobs in offices, and I've done this several times where I took a job in an office, that had never done development before. So I said, well, the first two things I have to do is craft a development plan. And while that takes a lot of research and some writing, it's more thinking and logical and measuring and uh, donor measurements and metrics, that type of thing. But the development plan and the case for support were the first two things I always tackled when I went in to any development office because you can't really make a persuasive case to anybody unless you have that written case for support. So that, to me, is the most important thing that you can write in a development office, because from that, 
you're going to be able to write grant proposals and donor letters and thank you letters and solicitation letters and ads for your website and promotional pieces that you might be using in various different things. So there is going to be a lot of writing involved for almost everybody that's in development. The other thing that many people are getting into is writing blogs. And I happen to have two different websites, one for my business of writing, and one is a personal interest of mine, and that is um, essential oil. So I write blogs for that as well. So I have two websites, and I post blogs usually on a weekly basis, and I also write blogs for other people. I've, in fact, I've written a few for Blue Meringue and uh, a few for some other sources like Charity Channel and things like that. So blog writing is a great way to get involved in writing and kind of test your ability to write. And what I have found is many authors of books start by, well, I have written a you know, three dozen blogs on this topic, so all I have to do is put those blogs together in some logical order, refine them, and I might have a book. So starting with blogs is great if you think that writing a book is way too intimidating and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I couldn't begin to write a book. But if you have written blogs for the last year or so, you may have enough material to write a book. So think about blog writing. It is different from writing a book, but it gives you a lot of great source material. And I have often started some of my books by going to articles and blogs that I've written and then converting them and, and incorporating them into a book. So that's another area that you can take. The other thing you can do is write articles for trade journals, newspapers, and magazines. And if you're a member of AFP, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, um, you've probably seen some of my articles in there. Excuse me, I had to get a drink of water there. Um, but I've written for numerous different trade articles, everything from um, there's a, a group in Palm Springs that, that writes, that publishes a magazine for uh, charitable, I think it's called Desert Charities, and I've written for AFP, and I've written for some other nonprofit times and some other things like that. So there are lots of opportunities to look at journals and newspapers and magazines and maybe even newsletters. Sometimes organizations that may not focus strictly on the nonprofit sector, maybe a business wants to write an article for their company newsletter on why their employees should get involved in volunteer activities. So that would be a perfect thing for you to write about if you work with volunteers a lot. So look at things outside your traditional area of expertise. If you are part of a national organization, I know we have some people on this call, I'm sure, that represent organizations like Junior Achievement or Boys and Girls Clubs or Big Brothers Big Sisters or the Red Cross or anything that has a national affiliation, maybe your national office is looking for newsletter articles or trade journal articles. So there's lots of ways you can get started in writing without thinking that you have to kind of bite off more than you can chew and think right away in the first attempt of writing a book. And again, all these articles and trade journals help you as a professional because it gives you some exposure. And especially if you're in, in the consulting world, you want to get a lot of exposure in the nonprofit community. So the more you can write, the more exposure you're going to get, and the better you're going to get at writing. So it's kind of a learn on the job. And if you work with an editor, you'll be able to really learn to hone your writing. And most of these newspapers and magazines and journals, they all have editors. So they will help you, and you'll start to see after you've written a couple articles, you'll probably see common mistakes that you make, like maybe you forget to do an Oxford comma, which some people want to use, and um, you might tend, tend to mix up certain words, like words that are synonyms. You might be using the wrong spelling or something like that. So you want to make sure 
that if you write, that you pay attention to the editors that are publishing these things and letting you know what's good about your writing and what's not so good about it because it will help you improve and hone your writing skills without even signing up for a class, although I certainly recommend that if you can do that, you might think about that as well. And then, of course, there are books. And many times people are just totally intimidated by the thought of writing an entire book. They say, oh, my gosh, how can you possibly have written all the books that you have written? And when do you find time to do it? How can you go about getting started? So one of the things that you might consider is being a contributing author. Now, my first book was a full-length book that I wrote myself. And I wrote several before I was invited to be a contributing author. But this was a great opportunity. If you don't feel like you want to have uh, the time, take the time, or maybe you don't feel like you're really ready for a full-length book yet, search around and talk to other authors and people who have written books because there are many authors who are doing compilation books where they're um, – talking to other experts in the field. For example, I have two books that I, uh, one I co-edited and one I contributed it to. One was You and Your Nonprofit. I co-edited that with another consultant, and we had about 50 different authors that participated in all aspects of, of things that pertain to nonprofits. And then I was a contributing author to You and Your Nonprofit Board, and that was a board governance expert who wanted to get other people who had worked a lot with boards and get their opinions. And, and so she collected a group of chapters written by different authors, and there were, I think, 25 authors in that one. And then another book that I contributed to while I was the editor, co-editor of was a book for consulting. It was uh, the consult, Nonprofit Consulting Playbook. And, again, we had 25 nonprofit consultants who we chose based on the fact that they had at least 10 years experience and got their articles on all different aspects of consulting from starting your business to what to call your business to how to market your business and legal aspects of a contract and things like that. So contributing author is a great way to get started if you're not ready to tackle a full-length book. Co-authoring can be fun, it can also be a challenge, and I have to be honest, the first time I co-authored a book, I swore I would never, ever do it again, because I thought co-authoring meant I'd have 50% of the work, and instead of that, it seemed like twice the work of, of writing a book myself, because every time one of us would write a chapter, the other one would critique it, and and then you'd have to go back and make changes based on the other person's input. But co-authoring after that, I found I was very fortunate, and I have probably about four or five co-authors since that. I'm where I learned a lot, and they learned a lot, I think. And co-authoring is great because you have somebody else who is giving you feedback and input and, and somebody to kind of share the agony of the writing process with. So think about some of those things if you are thinking about tackling a book because it doesn't have to be a real, real challenge. Now, how do you get started? Well, I mentioned taking class, and I think this can be really rewarding for you. Now, I have to admit that the class I took in college was creative writing, and I still really love creative writing, and I'm working on another, um, non or another fiction book right now. But if you're going to be writing a lot of technical type stuff, you might want to take a technical writing class. Or you might want to take several classes, maybe technical writing and creative writing, and see which fits your area best. But taking a class can be really, really helpful because you'll get some hands-on experience and you'll get some critiquing from the instructor, the professor, of course, that you're doing. And there are probably some online classes you can take in writing as well. So those are some things that you might want to think about to get started. Another thing that people always are concerned about is how do I possibly find time to write? Nobody ever has enough time in this world, and sometimes 
a lot of my friends think I, I drink a lot of caffeine because I talk fast and I'm always excited about things and I seem to accomplish a lot um, more than some of my colleagues do. But it's finding time to write is really a challenge. And I've talked to authors who have taken different approaches to this. I know one author that I talked to said she decided that if she spent one every every evening, maybe spent an hour or so writing, that if she did this for a year, at the end of the year, if she wrote one page a day, and that's not a lot, but if she wrote one page a day at the end of the year, she'd have a 365-page book, and that's a pretty hefty size book for most of us. So some people can be very disciplined, and they find that really works. They say, okay, I'm going to set aside an hour a day, or I'm going to set aside every Saturday morning, and I'm going to spend three or four hours every Saturday morning writing. Well, frankly, I guess I'm not that disciplined because for me, I find writing is much more of a creative process, and I have to, when I really have the inspiration, the book I'm writing now, the fiction book that I'm writing, is has spiritual overtones, and sometimes I'll come home from church on a Sunday and feel really inspired by something I heard my pastor talk about in his homily, and I'll say, I've got to get that into the book, and so I'll sit down and write maybe for three or four hours at a time, um, and then I might not touch the book again for a couple of weeks, and then I might spend a whole day working on it. So you have to know your own personality and what works with you um, because I think it's really helpful to work within your own system and don't try to force yourself into saying, I'm going to spend every Saturday, and then some Saturday – um, your significant other says, it's a beautiful day, let's go for a picnic. And you say, oh, I can't, I have to write. You don't want writing to be a chore. You want writing to be rewarding and to be fun. So finding the time to write, think about your own personality. The other thing that you have to think about is I'm a morning person, so I tend to want to write in the morning most times. But there are times when I get a second burst of energy in the evening or a thought occurs to me, and I think I better get this down before I forget about it. So occasionally I'll write in the evening, but I'm much more of a morning person. So if I can get up first thing in the morning and start writing at 7 or 8 a.m. and write for a couple of hours, that's more my style. But your style is going to be different. So think about what works for you and try to put writing into a schedule. But you do have to find some time to do it, obviously. I also am a firm believer in, um, I use Outlook, maybe use some other form of scheduling, but I actually will schedule my writing in Outlook and say, okay, I'm going to spend from 8 o'clock till 10 o'clock this day working on this book, and I'll put it into my Outlook calendar. So if I don't get it done and I have to reschedule it, at least I know it's there and it's at the top of my mind, and I'm going to be forced to reschedule it for another day. But if you don't put it in anything at all, then it just you just never get to it. It's something that most of us find was, well, I don't have the time to do it now. I also think it's really good to think about starting small and think about some of the things that I talked about, like writing blogs. That's a really great way. If you have your own website and you can write blogs, that's a great way to get started because they're usually pretty easy to write. For me, at least, they are. Um, and one of the things that I would suggest, in fact, I think somebody in the questions, I'm not really looking at all the questions, but every once in a while I glance over and I happen to see one, is how do you stay motivated to write regular content for your blogs? I'm big on planning. So what I do is I'll look at um, what I'm writing about and I might plan out, okay, I, a lot of times what I write about in my blogs, it relates to my books. So I'll say, okay, I'm going to write a series of six articles about getting ready for a capital campaign, and I'll schedule those out for six weeks in a row. And then I might think, well, I really want to write now about fundraising as a career, so I'm going to spend maybe, I usually do my blogs in series, not always, but most of the time I do 
a series of, okay, I'm going to write six articles about fundraising as a career. And then maybe I I want to focus on another book, and I'll say, well, I'm going to write ten articles about raising money from your business community or about building a stronger board. So I schedule all these out, and I know immediately what I want to write about. And, again, put it in your Outlook calendar. Okay, today's the day. And I do my blogging typically on the weekends because that's usually the time when I have time to to blog. And then I post it not only on my website, but I also post all my blogs on LinkedIn. And then through LinkedIn, you can, with a click of the mouse, you can transfer it to Facebook or to Twitter, or, and I do both of those. So if you start small with a project like that and say, okay, I'm going to spend every Saturday morning, I'm just going to spend an hour to write a blog and post it, that's a really simple thing that I think we can all find one hour out of our day, out of our week, to do a blog. So I would suggest starting with things like that. And then maybe you move up. Maybe somebody picks up your blog. I get a lot of comments on my blogs when I post them to my website or to LinkedIn. In fact, I just got one that really kind of tickled me, but it made me feel good. Um, It said, I just shared your blog with a colleague of mine who was doing research on this particular topic, and because I shared your blog, he took me out to dinner. So I felt really great that I got somebody a free dinner by sharing my blog. And those are the kind of things that are small but meaningful. So if you start posting blogs, people might pick this up and say, hey, I'd like you to write an article for this magazine, or I'd like you to write an article for this newsletter, or would you consider being a contributing author to a book I'm putting together? So starting small, you can kind of build your way up from going from there. I also think it's really important to talk to other authors. And you might think, well, why would an author want to help me? I'm competition. But I have found talking to other authors to be extremely rewarding. In fact, I've gotten some of the most well-respected authors in the nonprofit world to agree to write forwards to some of my books. And I think the more you read and the more you talk to other authors, you can get a lot of hints from them. And there's actually some online groups. I don't have the links to them right now. Um, But if anybody's interested, I can probably research it and forward that information if you email me. Um, But there are online groups for authors and for publishers and groups like that. So you might want to talk to some other authors. I also joined um, the authors – oh, I forgot what it's called. This is terrible now. But there's an association of authors – that provides actually a website for you and um, they'll list all your books. And they provide a lot of legal advice as far as, not necessarily legal advice, but they have um, articles written by attorneys that will give you advice on signing contracts and things like that. So talking to other authors can be really, really great for you. And it also gives you the opportunity to develop relationships and possibly collaborate with these authors. In fact, um, when I edited one of the books, there was one author who contributed to that, and I was so impressed with her writing. And I knew her just vaguely, but I didn't really know her. And I said, you know, let's get together. We were both going to the AFP conference, and we met there. And I said, you need to really write a book. You're such a good writer. And so we ended up collaborating and co-authoring a book. And those kind of relationships can come about the more you get involved with the world of authors. So look at some of the nonprofit books out there. And, you know, these people are not totally inaccessible. When I get people contact me saying, gosh, I'm thinking about writing a book, I'm always willing and able to help out other authors, especially ones who are thinking about it, for the first time, and I know I'm opening up a can of worms here because I could get 500 emails from people that want some help, but that's fine. I will answer those emails. It might take a little day or two to get back to you, but I do answer all my emails, and I'm always happy to share my experiences with other emerging authors. Now, there's some obstacles that you might have to face when it comes to writing. I have 
a couple really weird obstacles that probably none of you are going to share this experience. Um, but first of all, as much as I love to write, and of course, um, that picture, I was a few years younger. I now have totally gray hair, as you can see, and I'm in my 70s. Um, but from the time I was a child, I always did horrible in penmanship in school. And so my handwriting has always been awful. And I love to speak and present, but my worst fear in speaking is standing and writing on a flip chart because I always think, oh, my gosh, nobody's going to understand my writing. And my husband always used to laugh at me because I went to college as an adult. And I graduated magna cum laude with three different majors. And my husband said to me, you know, I think the reason you graduated with such high honors is because you sound like you know what you're talking about, and the professors could never read your writing, so they just assumed you were correct. <laughs> and I thought, oh, gosh, maybe he's right. But I've always had bad handwriting. So, And I started when we still had manual typewriters. Most of you are probably way too young to remember manual typewriters, and then we moved into emerging and to electric typewriters. And thank God the computer came along. So the computer enabled me to write all the books I did. But then I had two really uh, strange health issues which affected my my writing to some degree. One was I developed a severe case of vertigo, and uh, I couldn't actually focus on a computer screen because I could only spend a very limited amount of time in front of my computer when I would start to get dizzy. And then I found out through my therapist there was such a thing called a flicker-free computer monitor. So I now own one of those, and I'm able to spend time in front of my computer. So you can always overcome these obstacles. And then two years ago, I had a stroke, and unfortunately it affected my right side, so my right hand, and I'm right-handed. Um, I had a lot of trouble typing. And then I discovered another marvel of modern technology, Dragon Speak. So I actually wrote two of my books mainly using dragon speak because I had a hard time typing. Um, but my therapist wanted to encourage me not to get too hung up on dragon speak to keep that right hand moving. So now I'm able to type again. I still make a lot of mistakes, but that's what spell check is for, and, and that's what editors are for. So you can overcome a lot of different obstacles. Maybe your obstacle is that you have kids at home and they don't let you have the time to sit at your computer and write creatively. So maybe to overcome that obstacle, you'll have to change from being a, a mid-morning or afternoon person to being a morning person and get up and write before the kids get out of bed or write late at night after they go to bed, which some people do that have children at home. So there's always obstacles in everybody's path and they can certainly be overcome. If your obstacle is that you really have trouble with grammar or that you have trouble with punctuation, um, the picture on the right is my current wonderful flicker-free computer monitor, but the book that you see there is the Chicago Manual of Style, which happens to be what my publisher uses. So it's important to understand what style the publishers will want and to adhere to that. So if you have trouble with grammar and punctuation, there are some great tools that you can do. There's even online tools. like There's one I think it's called Grammar Girl or something like that that will tell you how to use things that are grammatically correct. So you can overcome all these obstacles. If I can overcome them and I'm the most technical uh, disadvantaged person in the world, as Stephen will probably tell you, we were – in a bit of a panic three minutes before this webinar because I couldn't get my uh, my program to sign on. So I'm not the most technical person, but I've been able to resolve my problems, and you can too. Um, advancing in writing, once you start getting serious about this, maybe you've been writing blogs and some articles, and you're thinking, I really need a book, you might consider getting a writing coach. And I have a friend who was writing a book, and her writing skills are fine. She's an excellent writer. But what she was having trouble doing was focusing, first of all, her time, and secondly, focusing on the order of where to put which chapter and that type of thing. 
So she engaged the services of a writing coach and has recently just published her book. So she, it worked great for her. I have never used a writing coach, I must admit. But if you're struggling with things like that and you think, I really need some help in this, I've often recommended to people after looking at their writing that they do need to engage a writing coach. So that's something you might consider doing. So when you're ready to take the next step and you want to move from doing nothing to being a blog writer or from being a blog writer to writing a book, don't be afraid that you're going to fall off that ladder. Maybe your book isn't going to be a bestseller, but you've accomplished something and you've left a legacy. To me, I think about writing as a legacy in so many different ways. As far as my nonprofit books, I think, oh, my gosh, you know, if somebody in another country has picked up my book and emails me and tells me they were able to accomplish something because of my book, they had a successful campaign or they were able to convince their boss that they needed to invest more in development or whatever it was, to me that's a legacy that I'm leaving for the nonprofit world. But also the royalties I get are a legacy for my children because they never end. After I die, they still have um, some royalty income coming in. So don't be afraid of taking that next step. And when you are ready to write a book, there's – one big area that a lot of people face and they're not quite sure how to handle it, and that is should I self-publish or should I use a traditional publisher? And self-publishing today is so much easier. I, I have to tell you, I have self-published two books. Um, the first one was my first novel, The Matriarch, and I swore I would never self-publish again because it was a lot of work, even though somebody else, was doing it, but when you self-publish a book, there's a lot of work that you either have to do yourself or pay somebody else to do, like get an ISBN number, get a Library of Congress number, um, do the editing. You have to either engage an editor or pay the self-publishing company because they're still published through a company to do editing for you. Um, and marketing is non-existent unless you do it yourself. So think about the advantages and disadvantages. Of course, the big advantage of self-publishing is you make a lot more money per book because you, you're instead of getting royalties, you're getting after the printing costs and if you've paid for editing and things like that, you're getting the whole proceeds of the book. The second one that was recently, and I loose, used the term loosely self-published, was Board Bound Leadership, with which I co-authored, and my co-author did all of the publishing angle of it. We decided on an arrangement instead of a 50-50 arrangement. I said, I don't want to do all that stuff, and she had already self-published books, so she did all the Library of Congress and the ISBN numbers and the cover design and everything else, um, and, and so that was worth it for me to do that. So... Sometimes self-publishing can be good, but be prepared that you're going to have to do a lot of work yourself or you're going to have to pay somebody to do things like editing. And the first, in the matriarch, the first time I published it, after it was already printed, I saw some typos and I had to resubmit it again. So you have to be really cautious of this. And one word of advice is you cannot edit your own work no matter how good you are. And I have edited dozens of books because I also serve as an editor for Charity Channel Press and for the Genius Press. And even though I'm an editor, there was a lot of work um, involved, and you can't edit your own work. It's just impossible. Now, going with a traditional publisher, I think, you know, has a lot of advantages. I've used three different publishers, so I have three books on here that represent each of those three publishers. One of the things that sometimes people think, oh, the publisher is going to do all this marketing for me. Well, don't get your hopes up too much on that because, yes, publishers will do some extent of marketing, but they still rely on you to do a lot of marketing. And most publishers, one of the questions they ask you when you submit a, a book proposal is, what do you intend to do to market this book? So, yes, there's an advantage um, my first publisher got me some radio announcements. 
My second publisher provided wonderful editing skills, but not much in the way of marketing. And my third one provided both editing and marketing, but still depends on me, and it does depend on you to market your own book. So I want to talk a little bit about what you're going to need to do to market your book once you do have it. And the first thing I would suggest is building a website. Now, a lot of people have a website just for their own book. Now, because I have like 20-some books out, my website focuses on me as an author, and I just redid it. Um, And my website designer found this wonderful picture. I just love it, of a pen and flowers. And he thought it, it kind of showed what my skills were as an author. So, And you can see my blog posts are on my home page of the website. But you do want to build some kind of a website. If you already have one, you might just put a page on it about your author. When I was much more active in consulting, my website focused on my consulting work, and then I had a page about my books. But now I'm really focusing mainly on the book. So you can see I have my blogs, and I have my books, and I have education that I'll post to different uh, webinars and things like that that I'm doing, but I really want people to focus on my books. Another thing you can do is using social media, and this is an example of my Facebook page that I also had redesigned. My main Facebook page is is used mostly for personal stuff, but I have one page on here for my business, and that shows all the different books. And then I have a page for each and every one of my books. So when I post blogs, I post them to the Facebook page that pertains to that particular book. So if I'm writing about the development plan, I'll post it on my Facebook page that has the development plan. So there's a lot of different social media. I mean, Facebook is just one. There's obviously, you know, Twitter and Pinterest and, oh, gosh, I could – LinkedIn, I have found LinkedIn is really helpful for authors, and they also have some groups designed for authors. So LinkedIn and Facebook are the two I use the most. But social media is a great way to market your books. And then public speaking. I mentioned getting out and speaking about your books, and this really helps a lot. Sometimes if you're in the nonprofit world, you might be able to speak to your local AFP chapter or you might get invited to speak. At, I've spoken, like I said, all over the world. Um, and most of the time when I speak, I have a table that I can sell books or they have a bookstore at the conference, if it's a conference that I'm speaking at. So if you're not a good speaker, you might want to think about, as you're writing your book, what can I do to become a better speaker because that's a great way to get out and promote your book. And then, of course, there's always the king of book selling, Amazon. You should probably think about setting up an author page on Amazon. I think it's called Author Central. And you can actually track the sales of your books on Amazon, and you can offer special promotions if you're self-published. If you're using a traditional publisher, the publisher um, would be able to present special offers through Amazon. But Amazon is by far the king of booksellers. I, I'm finding my publishers, or when I get my royalty statements, are broken down by how many books are sold on the publisher's website, how many books are sold in bricks and mortar stores, and how many are sold on Amazon. And by far, Amazon is the biggest every for every book on my list, I think. So that's another thing that you should think about when it comes to promoting your books. And then you can do book signings and other events. Um, The one picture on here is a group of us that were all authors, and we participated in a book fair that was held in Las Vegas every year. But we found that most of the people there were looking more in the realm of fiction books, so we didn't participate this year because we were all authors of nonfiction books. Um, The second picture is a book signing that I did in Bermuda. I was invited to come and speak there, and she said, we want to buy a copy of your book for everybody who attends the conference, which was great, (laughs) but nice boost in sales. And if you can do things like that, that's really great. 
Um, the third picture is actually a friend of mine who edited one of my books, and he was at a GPA, Grant Professionals Association, conference and saw my book on the shelf with numerous books, actually, of mine, but he's holding up the one that he edited for us. So there's a lot of different opportunities to get out there in marketing. I could probably go on for an hour about that, but since we're almost out of time, um, I'm going to. I want to make sure we have time for questions and answers. But I did want to give you all my links to contact me um, by email, my website, my Facebook page that is the, the author page, um, my Twitter account, my Pinterest account, and my LinkedIn account. So feel free to contact me with any questions that you might have. If you don't get them answered today, we have about, I think, about eight minutes to answer questions. So I'm going to turn it back to Steve and see if he has uh, some questions for us. Yeah, we've got a few in here. Thanks, Linda. And um, if, you, if you've been thinking of a question um, and haven't sent it in, we've got probably about five minutes, so now is the time. I'm going to start with probably the best question I have ever seen on any of my webinars, and I've been doing this for six years. <laughs> wow. Kelsey wants to know, and I want to know too, Linda, are you a fan of the Oxford comma? A fan of what? The Oxford comma. Oh, I am a fan of the Oxford comma. In fact, I almost <laughs> put a slide in here. I, I posted this on Facebook that said, commas save lives, and the quote was, let's eat grandma, and then the second one, was, let's eat comma grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah. just love that example because I le actually legally um, most lawyers will use it because legally the meaning can be different if you say something and something comma and something else or if you put right. you know red comma white comma and blue you're talking about three different colors. Right. So that is a great question. <laughs> No, it is. I wasn't being sarcastic, by the way, Chelsea. I think that's really important. I'm also I'm also a fan of the Oxford comma, so thanks for, for getting the record straight. <laughs> I, I thought that you might say that. Um, here's one from um, – oh, I lost it. Here it is. Uh, from, from Jane, uh, where would you find a writing coach uh, if you were to recommend one? What's the best way of maybe sourcing that? Is it someone you should know, or are there – people who do that specifically that you can reach out there, to? What do you think about a writing coach? There are people who do it specifically, and um, I probably can, if, if a person wants to email me individually, I can probably find you some websites. Like I said, I haven't used a writing coach, but I know many people do. Um, you can probably go online and search for it, but then you run the risk of, you know, is this person really good or aren't they? So I would probably talk um, by word of mouth, so if, if they want to contact me directly, I can send you the name of a couple writing coaches that I know people have used that okay. have been very happy with them. Cool. Um, along the same lines, Kara was wondering, how would you find an editor if you wanted to self-publish? And That's probably the same thing. I mean, like I do yeah. editing. I've never done it specific. I've usually done it for a publisher, but I could mm – -hmm. um, you know, do it for somebody individually. Again, I would go by somebody that does it um, and, and is referred by somebody who's used them. Mm -hmm. Aren't there colleges that will have maybe their English major or creative writing students offer that as a service? They, they or am I imagining do. that? I haven't really, like I said, I haven't used editors other than ones that were recommended by my publisher. And not all editors mm -hmm. are good. I know for a fact I had yeah. some books that um, an editor took it, and I said, you know, frankly, this editor doesn't know what she's talking about, so the publisher had <laughs> to fire the editor. <laughs> so, and so, and isn't know, it true that, I mean, the term editor is kind of a loaded term. I mean, there's an editor that will help you find grammatical errors, and then right. there is an editor. Could you maybe kind of split those up? Because I think the, the editor you're talking about is, is more like the content, you know, the the idea, right. the flow, and, those kinds of things. And sometimes they're called a comprehensive editor because they're going to look mm. at things like, well, this doesn't make sense here. You should really talk about that there, or you should move this here, or you should expand on this. And then you have mm -hmm. the, what's typically called a copy editor 
that looks for mm-hmm. the Oxford commas and make sure that you have the mm-hmm. right spelling and the right punctuation and that type of thing. So that's that's a great point. There is a, definitely a distinction in the type of editors that are available. And I know mm-hmm. my publisher uses um, both a comprehensive editor and a copy editor on every book because they're two different, really two different functions. Right. One person is Makes looking sense. at the big picture, and one person is looking at the details. Yep. Um, I got time for one last question. I'll, I'll pull out Brandon's here, and and Linda, I know you kind of answered a, another question from him on the fly, but um, he's wondering that if if you're not feeling motivated, do you think the writing suffers if you if you write no matter how you feel? So in other words, if you feel unmotivated but you still write just because you're trying to hold yourself accountable, do you think the writing or maybe the creativity suffers because of that, or should you always wait for inspiration to strike? For me, I think it does. Like I said, some people are motivated and they'll write every day, but I wonder in my mind, people who do that, if they don't have to go back and rewrite a lot because I couldn't, I can't write when I'm not inspired to write. So mm-hmm. I think it. I think for me it does work that way. But for other people, it it might not be. And I think a lot of it depends on if you're writing about things you know real well too. If you're writing fiction and you can be creative, you definitely have to be inspired for that. My fiction works always take me way longer than my nonfiction books because the nonfiction mm-hmm. is coming from knowledge that I have in my head and I'm just getting it down on paper. And that I can do without necessarily being real, real inspired. But when I'm writing fiction, I have to be in a real creative mood to do that. Mm. Good point. That makes a lot of sense. You well, Linda, great, um, great, by the way. yeah, really good. This has been a really fun one. I know it's been a little different than what we've done, but I'm really glad we did it because um, I think there's a real big opportunity for – for fundraisers to share their knowledge. I mean, it's never been easier to create a blog as kind of a minimum right. way to get started, and it can really be a good way to, you know, potentially increase your income, um, you know, by directly selling your content or maybe you know making yourself more appealing to, to other types of employers. So, this is great, Linda. Thanks for spending an hour out of your day for doing this. Oh, well, thank you. Hopefully we didn't cut into your, your book writing time <laughs> too much. Nope, I'm not writing today. <laughs> it's not on my agenda. It has to be soon, though, because I am working on another nonfiction book that I have to get cracking nice. on. My my co-author is in Israel right now, and I promised her I'd work on it while she was gone. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you get back to it. I'm on it soon. <laughs> um, but do reach out to Linda, follow her on Twitter, send her an email. Um, obviously a wealth of knowledge, one of our favorites for sure. Um, and thank you all for hanging out with us for an hour or so. I know we got started a couple minutes late. I apologize for that. But um, by the way, if any of you really want to get into blogging, um, Bloomerang accepts guest blog posts. I'm going to share a link with all of you in the chat. Um, we always love to have fundraisers just share their knowledge on our blog. You don't have to be a Bloomerang customer to do that if you check out um, our daily blog posts, you'll see lots of consultants, fundraisers, lots of non-Boomerang people just sharing knowledge there. Um, and we will compensate you. We will donate $100 to your organization for every post that you send over. Um, so if that is of interest to you, if you are maybe looking for a place to, to get started publishing, you know, it, it could be our blog. So check out that link I just shared with you. Shoot me an email or a tweet if you want to learn more. Um, and we'd love to see you again on next week's webinar. Uh, we're going to go back to the Thursday schedule, and we're going to talk about gift planning specifically for Gen X and Gen Y donors, those pesky millennials. Um, not much people talking about Gen X donors, even though they are getting up in, up in age there a little bit and probably have some high earning potential. So uh, Lisa and Dave, uh, Lisa Chimola and Dave Tinker are going to join us to talk about that super smart duo there. Um, both CFREs, both super involved in the AFP community. So don't miss that one. It's going to be really fun. Um, going to be a, a new presentation for us as well. So we'd love to see you there. If that doesn't quite tickle your fancy, there's lots of other webinars you can check out uh, throughout the spring and summer. So hopefully we will see you again on some other uh, Bloomerang webinar. So have a good weekend. I guess say rest of the week. It's only Wednesday. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye now. Bye.